Today's gospel passage is a very confusing one. There are different interpretations given to what, what and why this, this parable was given. I remember when I was small, I, I barely used to study very well um, when my parents asked me to study. I would all, always push it off to another day. And the exams would kind of dawn. And as the exams come in, then the realization starts setting in. Till that time, you think that you have time. And then it just hits you. I remember we, I was in year six or year seven, and, and it was my chemistry exam. And uh, my mother just told me the night before, she said, are you prepared? And I said, yeah, I'm prepared. I didn't even open my books. <laughs> and she said, OK, if you're prepared in an hour, I'll just ask you things from the syllabus. And I was terrified. And during that time, that one hour, I just kept flipping pages after pages and thinking that, you know, it will all stick in my mind as a miracle. My mother asked me questions, and I didn't know a thing. I don't know how I wrote that exam. I, I, I think the teachers gave me a lot of grace marks, but I passed. <laughs> so if there are any teachers over here, do give your students grace marks. <laughs> they might end up priests in the end. <laughs> <laughs> but it's important we realize you know, that at times we always think that there is time. There is time. You know, we can always work this out. In the gospel passage, that seems to be the attitude. He's playing around. The manager is playing around, and that is when the, the owner comes and says, I want an account. And then he realizes, there's no time now. I'm in trouble, because I'm going to lose this job. And then what remains? What about the future? And then we see him start preparing for the future. What he's basically doing, be it right or wrong, and that we can question Jesus once we get there, uh, if we get there, and uh, we can ask the Lord, Lord, can you explain what you actually said? But be it the right and wrong of it, the, the reality is he's preparing himself for something ahead. And that is what we need to embrace as well. What are we preparing for? What are we preparing for? We are meant to be, as the letter, of the letter to the Philippians tells us, we are the kingdom people. The kingdom of God is our destination. And therefore, we are kingdom people. So what are we preparing for? I found it very interesting when I walked around these days, when I walked around uh, the place, uh, something that struck me is that you have a lot of learning centers over here. <laughs> and someone told me it's a billion dollar industry, you know, these learning centers. And I was very surprised because all the malls have it. It seems like you go and drop your children to the learning center and then you walk through the malls. <laughs> So it's, you know, uh, business on both sides. The learning center gets business, and the mall gets business as well. But it's amazing to see how many learning centers. It's good. That means education is important. And then the next thing that surprised me was, if you have a learning center, then next to it, you have a wellness center. So you have all the reflexology, you have uh, the massages and whatever it is, and, and whatever beauty you want to uh, do for yourself, be it, be it man or woman, whatever you want to do, your facials or your, uh, I don't know, your threadings or your, you know, uh, or, or, or with the nails and the hands, what do they call that? Uh, uh, pedicure. I'm, I'm scared to say it because for, at one point in my mind, it just kept sticking pedigree, pedigree. <laughs> and I actually said that in one of my sermons, pedigree, and that's when they all look shocked. <laughs> what are they doing with their nails and pedigree? It doesn't match. But. So there's wellness centers. There are these uh, the learning centers. And then 
and then you ask yourself, you know, there's, there's, it's wonderful that as a community, as, as a society, there's emphasis given on health, there's emphasis given on education. But as Christians, we need to ask ourselves, what is our priority? Not one amongst the many, but what is the priority of my life for the sake of my family? Because the society here is very family-oriented, or else you wouldn't even have those learning centers. Those learning centers are because you care about your children, you care about their future. And so even in the midst of all of this, for us to ask ourselves, what am I? What am I investing in for my family? Because you are investing. I'm sure the learning centers don't come cheap, right? They're costly? Yeah. yeah, yes, they're costly. So you are putting in a lot of investment into that. I'm sure the wellness centers don't come cheap as well. And so we put a lot of investment into our health, we put a lot of investment into what our children can, um, what, what education our children can be given. But we ask ourselves, what have I invested genuinely for my family keeping the future if my future is the kingdom of God, then keeping that future in mind, what am I investing for my family? It is a very important question we need to ask ourselves every day. What am I investing for my family? For what lies ahead? It's good to to check our hearts to see in which ways can I invest for my family? What lies ahead? These days we've been having this tridom on the first day we spoke about faith and that's the three themes of the, of the tridom as well. It was a part of the themes of the retreat as well. Faith, yesterday we spoke about community and then there is family. So in family, what are we investing? And that is where we need to ask ourselves the question, am I giving enough for their future, looking ahead? Because when God gave you a soul in your hand, when God gave you a son, when God gave you a daughter, when God gave you a husband, a wife, God gave you a soul in your hand. You get onto the flight, um, generally, they would they, they use a terminology called there are 167 souls on board, or if uh, if if there is um, an unfortunate tragedy, they usually state 150 souls were lost. Not just persons, not just human beings with just the body, but the souls. And for us, it is even more significant when you are given someone into your family, you are given a soul. And God will ask an account for the state of that soul from you. So when we as priests, our ministry is for you. And God will ask an account of the state of your soul. Now, tomorrow you have a fair in, this, uh, in the parish, right? Yes. yes. Now, surely God is not going to, when the time comes, God is not going to ask Father Adrian why there wasn't enough food during the fair, <laughs> even if it runs out. Maybe the, maybe the others will ask. But God's not going to ask that. He's going to always ask, what's the state of the soul? I gave you souls for you to take care of. What is the state of that soul? And that's the same question for you as well within your own families. The Lord will ask the question, what is the state of their soul? So what am I doing? You are addressing the state of their body. You are addressing the state of their mind. But are we addressing the state of their soul? And so whenever we offer a prayer for our family, we need to, we need to make that clear distinction 
between what our immediate prayers are and what our long-term prayers are. So often it's the immediate prayers that we offer. So I'm sure when, when you come for prayers as well, that is what you speak about. My, my son's education, my husband's not well, I'm not well. There's always an immediate prayer. That is the immediate prayer. You pray for your, your, your son, your daughter's marriage. You pray for your grandchildren and their health. That's an immediate prayer. But what is your long-term prayer? The long-term prayer is always directed to the state of the soul because we know ultimately we are not going to stay here and live here forever. We are going to go back into God's kingdom. That is my final destination. How many of you would like to go into God's kingdom? Can you raise your hands? If you want to go there only halfway, you can raise it half. <laughs> okay. How many of you want to go there now? <laughs> that means today, now, tonight. So often we think that that's, that's not going to happen. That, you know, we have time on our hands. But this is where the parable also reminds, well, maybe we don't have time on our hands. And therefore, every day I need to be concerned about the state of my soul and the state of my family's soul. So am I addressing the state of their soul? Is that my priority? Because God will ask an account for the state of their soul. So are we addressing it on a daily basis? Is my first prayer, we need to ask ourselves, what is the first prayer I make for my husband? What is the first prayer I make for my wife? Is my first prayer, Lord, let, let her stop nagging? <laughs> is my first prayer, let him be more generous? Is my first prayer for my son, my daughter, Lord, I pray that they get through their exams and they do well in their studies? Is my first prayer, Lord, let them, let the sickness they are struggling with, let them get healed? If that is my first prayer, then I've got my priority wrong. I'm sorry to say that. But I've got my priority wrong. Every prayer for my family should start with a prayer for the state of their soul. Lord, let their souls be kept pure so that when the time comes, they will find union with you in your kingdom. Pray for the state of their soul when they are alive rather than desperately praying for the state of their soul when they are dead. I'm not saying don't do it. <laughs> I'm saying we have more intensity when we are praying for the state of their soul in the month of November. We're all busy giving masses for, for the state of everyone's soul who has passed away in the family, and we fail to realize that when they are alive, far more important to pray for the state of their soul asking the Lord to protect it. And therefore, our prayers need to be, need to be fine-tuned into the priority of God's kingdom so that those prayers are connected to the state of their soul. There's a beautiful, um, there, there's a beautiful uh, verse in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, verse, Psalm 51, verse 10. Psalm 51, verse 10. 10, the word reads, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. When you pray for your loved ones, pray this verse. And pray if you're praying for your son, create in my son a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within him. If you're praying for your daughter, you pray, create in my daughter a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within her. 
Cast her not away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit away from them. Make a beautiful prayer for the state of their soul so that when the time comes and there will be a battle for their soul and there's a battle always going on for the state of our soul, the evil one's not just going to sit quietly. He's always going to be at it because the ultimate battle is the battle for the kingdom. Our entry into the kingdom. That is why Jesus came onto the earth. And therefore, we need to go beyond just the immediate. I'm not saying don't pray for the immediate. Pray for your children's education. Pray for their health. Pray for your marriages. It's fine. But the priority, the main prayer, the starting prayer, and the ending prayer should always be for the state of the soul. For when the time comes, the soul will be prepared for that battle. Maybe today your children don't have that battle, but there will come a time and maybe you won't be around. But that prayer that you offered will sustain their soul. There might be a time way, way later, 50 years later, and you will not be here in spite of all these wellness clinics you have. <laughs> you will not be around. But the state of their soul will be protected because dad, mom prayed for the state of my soul. It's essential to do it. Make Jesus the priority in your families. Make the kingdom of God a normal conversation. It is important. What do we converse about in our families? What do we talk about? It's beautiful. In the Old Testament, there are these times when, when um, it is told to the people of God by Moses, by Joshua, it is said, tell your children Tell your children what God did for them. Tell your families what God did for them. So often, we speak about our achievements to our children. You know, we always say, you know, you have it so easy when we were younger during those days. You relate to that? Yes. You guys, you have it so easy. You know how hard it was for us. And I struggled and I battled and I got through and I've reached here. Well, don't tell your story. Tell God's story in your life. Tell God's story in your life. Make that a normal conversation. How when you were weak and you knelt in your weakness, God did not leave his hand from you. Tell them that. That is how you pass on to the next generation, the legacy of God, the legacy of faith, the legacy of God's faithfulness. That is when for them, somewhere deep within their heart, it is now etched. Even though they will make their own journeys and they'll be confused at certain moments, they will always come back. They will always come back because you etched it in their heart. So speak about it. Pray. Make family prayer your priority. Don't make it something that you do when you have time. No, if the kingdom of God is your priority, then your family prayer needs to be your priority. If that means you're the only one going to sit for that family prayer. And they don't want to sit, but let them see you sitting and thinking, knowing that my mom or my dad is sitting and offering up prayers for the family. One day they will have their own family, and when they are trapped and they are struggling, they will at least know how to kneel down and pray because they saw you do it. Make the kingdom your priority. I always thank the Lord for, for my parents Many people ask me, what's my vocation story? You want to hear my vocation story? Yes. We love hearing gossip, don't we? <laughs> so there is one particular moment when I actually made that decision to become a priest, and that was uh, pretty dramatic. But I'm going to keep that aside, because that is, that is more, more important than that moment. 
There's one particular dramatic moment when I actually felt the call, but I'm not going to speak about that. Not because I don't want to give you the joy of gossip and hearing <laughs> gossip, but because there was a more significant moment before that. Every night when my parents called the family to family prayer, it was my dad. My dad would say, let us pray. And I would hate it. It was so terribly boring. <laughs> but there was not a day when they would not have that family prayer. And so even if I didn't like it, somewhere it was etched in my heart. At that time, I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. I went to church because my parents went. I went to church because I wanted to please them. I didn't have a relationship with Jesus. You ask me if I sat for family prayer with a great interest and thirst? No. It was boring for me. I didn't understand it. I found it very repetitive. But if you want to know my vocation story, that is from where it comes. Somewhere they put it into my heart and they etched it there and said, this is the story of my family. For my father who comes from very humble beginnings, for him, that is how he sees it. This is the story of our family that God didn't leave our hands. Let it be for us as well. Make your family prayer the story of your life. Build altars. I love this concept that they had in the Old Testament. You know, when they, in the book of Joshua, when they passed the, uh, when they crossed the river and they went, when the rivers parted and they went on to the other side, Joshua says, let's build an altar and they take 12 stones and they built an altar. It's something that they do very regularly in the Old Testament. They, it would be a dramatic moment of God's intervention and they would build an altar. Why was the altar built? So that when anyone passes that way later, that story remains of what God did for them. Build altars in your families. Let every story and every moment of God's intervention, let it be an altar that you're proud to talk about. Don't camouflage it by saying, you know, oh, I just got that strength from somewhere. No, you got that strength from God. You got that strength because Jesus did not abandon you. Then proudly let it be known, the Lord did not abandon me. There you're building an altar. Build altars like this all over. And your children will make those journeys across here and there and they will see those altars and they will be reminded of how the Lord protected you. And in the same way, the Lord will protect them. You know, a terminology used in the Old Testament is the God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's a very regular terminology used amongst the Israelites. The God of our ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Why? Why were they saying the God of our ancestors? Because they were reminding themselves, just as God protected Abraham, just as God provided for Isaac, just as God blessed Jacob, in the same way, God will bless us. The God of our forefathers is the God of our life. And that should be the story for your family. That is when you're addressing the state of their soul. They might have their ups and downs and life is tough and hard and it's going to get tougher and harder for them. Life is going to be tougher and harder for marital relationships than it was way before. It will always be a battle. But know that as long as you are praying for the state of your family's soul, one day in God's kingdom, he will ask you, about the state of their soul and you can look at the Lord eye to eye and say that is what I prayed for every day of my life here on earth I prayed for their soul and that will bear fruit in abundance so as we are coming to the end of this thridham and as we are celebrating this this beautiful parish and and we are celebrating our community Remember, the parish community comes together because of the state of our soul. 
That is what we are all ultimately praying for. All this spirituality and all this prayer is about our soul. It is not about our body. It is not about our comforts. It is not about our blessings. It is about the state of our soul. We are celebrating the Eucharist for the state of our soul. We go into the confessional for the state of our soul. We ask the Lord to bless our relationships for the state of our soul. So everything is about the state of our soul. So let's pray for that grace and gift, asking the Holy Family's intercession in a special way. Let's close our eyes for a moment. And at this moment, you pray for your family and pray for the souls, for every soul in your family. True, it's the month of November and we've all been praying for the ones who have passed away. We thank the Lord for them and we pray for them. But more so, tonight, pray for the state of the soul of every member in your family. Lord, like you protected us, protect them. Like you built us up in the faith, build them up in the faith. Lord, never abandon them. Even though they might be making their own journey at this moment, confused, troubled, and disturbed, Lord, let the altars of your intervention in my life be a reminder to my loved ones that the Lord will never abandon them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.